it's this word servant. Some of your translations are going to say bond servants and others are going to say slaves. And immediately some people are triggered because they're going to say, well, there you have it. The Bible supports slavery. Slow down. In the Roman time, upwards of 50% of citizens were actually slaves. So Rome would invade a country. They would move their governors and their politicians there. Men and women and children would become slaves and they didn't have any rights. And so what Peter is actually writing here is that the overwhelming majority of his church would have actually been slaves. So this is not condoning slavery, but what it actually is doing, it is setting a time bomb in the Roman citizenship to where the ethics of the Bible will actually lead to the downfall of Rome. You say, how is that possible? Because the way Christians lived versus the culture flipped the world upside down on its head. Because in the Bible, here's what it says. There's neither Jew nor Greek, nor slave, nor free, nor male, nor female. See, according to the Bible, slaves are free, and those who think they're free actually are slaves to sin. And it was the early church that began to to distribute the sacraments to everybody, slaves and to women. And so they're baptizing slaves. They're giving communion to slaves. They're incorporating slaves into their public gathering when no one else would do that. And they were allowing women to come into the services and to prophesy according to 1 Corinthians chapter 11. And so women had no other opportunity to do that. In fact, Christianity has been the most progressive whenever it comes to the liberation of people of color into women. I know that doesn't sound popular in vogue to say today, but if you look through all of human history, it was Christians who abolished slavery. First in Rome, William Wilberforce, as he abolished slavery in Europe. It was Harriet Beecher Stowe who wrote Uncle Tom's Cabin after having a vision from God, wrote the book to be able to show the horrors of slavery. Another Christian man named Abraham Lincoln read that book when he met Harriet Beecher Stowe. He said, so you're the little woman who has turned this country upside down. And he ran on an abolitionist platform, gave his life for the ending of slavery as well. It was Jackie Robinson who broke the color barrier as a Bible-believing Christian, his manager as a Christian that wanted him to break that barrier. And it was the pastors of the civil rights movement led by Martin Luther King, who was enabled for equal rights under the law because of that. Christians are the ones who had led that, spearheaded that movement. Christians are the ones that have welcomed and incorporated women into public gatherings as well. Because there's either Jew nor slave, male nor free, nor, nor Greek, nor Jew, or men and women, all one in Jesus Christ. And so the Bible is not actually condoning slavery. It is actually teaching believers how to live kingdom down instead of living culture up. But don't believe me. It's okay. I got a verse. Here's what this verse says. 1 Timothy 1.9. Understanding this, that the law, okay, the law is not laid down for the just, but for the lawless and for the disobedience. For ungodly sinners, unholy profane, for those who strike their fathers and mothers, murderers, sexually immoral, men who practice homosexuality, what's the word? Enslavers, liars, perjurers, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Here's a big long list of things that the Bible says these are immoral, these are wrong. And what do we find right there in the middle? Enslavers. Now, people will say, I agree with that one. Can we all agree racism is evil? Can we all agree that slavery is evil? Okay, we like that one, but what about the rest in the list? What about the rest of the list? See, many people want to pick and choose what they view as moral as long as they agree with it. But when something disagrees with it, all of a sudden, nope, that's, that is a, I, can't, I can't take it. Oh, bigotry, ah, intolerance, ah, let me invent a word to be able to make you feel bad. See, we cannot just pick and choose what we decide is moral. Where does our society derive its morals from? I don't know. They just make it up along the way. Because at one time, slavery was moral. Today, we'd say it's immoral. At one time, we'd say oppression of women was moral. Now we'd say that's not moral. Well, what, what changed? See, if you come from a secular, atheistic background... You have no right to talk about morality. Why is that? Because you're just making up as you go along. Wait until somebody else gets in a position of authority and then it begins to change. 
you have no basis to talk about morality. For non-Christians, their morals are made up by culture, but for Christians, our morals are made up through scripture. And culture changes, but scripture never changes. And for those of you who come from an atheistic background, you have no right to talk about this because according to evolution, it's might makes right, survival of the fittest, only the strong survive and the weak will die off. And so for you talking about justice, for you talking about morality, you're a hypocrite because you're appealing to a law that you don't actually believe in. You're appealing to a lawgiver without actually believing in that lawgiver. You have no basis on which you can establish what morality is. But for us as Christians, our morality is defined by the scriptures. So let's just take a moment because I got nothing better to do. It's been three services. So let's just look at this long list. Do we agree that, let's say, striking your father and mother is immoral? We would say that. TikTok says otherwise. The amount of disrespect that parent, that children are giving to their parents is, is completely wrong, but societally acceptable. I mean, what about this one? Uh, murders. Is murder wrong? What about abortion? If, if murder is the taking of the innocent life, then there is no life that is more innocent than a preborn child. You say, but what about choice? Whose choice? Yours or that child's? See, the only reason why you got a choice is because you got out of the womb. We read on and we say, sexually immoral men who practice homosexuality, LGBTQ plus issues, gay marriage, transgenderism, bisexuality, unisex bathrooms, pronouns, I would say immoral, perjurers, liars, we all agree on that, and whatever else is contrary to sound doctrine. Here's my question for you. Those who want to live culture up, I know why I believe racism is wrong. Why do you? Do you have any, anything, to, anything to back that claim up? No, it's just whatever culture says. I, I know why I believe that there is equality between men and women because God made us both in the image and likeness of God. Okay, what's your reason? I know why I believe that abortion is murder. Why do you believe that it's not? I know why I believe that sexual immorality is immoral, but what makes you think that it's okay? because you've basically just become a law unto yourself. Right. If you don't believe in God and his rules, you will surrender to the mob rules. Wow. And eventually culture will change and your opinions and your ideas will look silly in a hundred years. Right. Yeah. 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 But the Bible says the grass withers and the flowers fade, but the word of the Lord is for ever. Culture changed, scripture does not. Yeah. And as believers, you cannot edit scripture to fit culture. You cannot do enough hermeneutical gymnastics to be able to make the Bible say what you think or what you want it to say. And for many of us as Christians, what, what we're feeling right now in the room is you're saying, but pastor, you're getting dangerously close. I think you should just keep your opinions to yourself. How dare you get your religion in my politics? Let me say something. If you have a right to speak what your unbelief says, I have a right to speak what my belief says. That's what makes this country so great is that if you wanna live culture up, fine. I choose to live kingdom down. And come November, we'll see who wins. But many of us, we have been brainwashed into thinking that we have to check our beliefs at the door of the ballot box and we have to vote against our convictions and violate our conscience. See, people are trying to say, be quiet, sit down, don't post anything, don't say anything, get your religion out of my politics. You know what they're doing? They're suppressing, they're suppressing your freedoms. Because you have a freedom of the First Amendment, which is the freedom of practicing religion, the freedom of speech, the freedom of assembly, and the 14th Amendment, which says we will not hold anyone's vote back based upon race, color, creed, or their own nationality or gender. And so when people are telling you, you cannot get religion and politics, what they're actually doing is they're suppressing your vote and by your voice. Right. If they get to practice their 
freedom of speech, we get to practice ours. If they get to practice their unbelief, then we get to practice our belief. And, and for us in the church, we have been tricked into thinking that these are just political issues. Oh, I'm just going to mind my business because these are just political issues. These are just political issues. No, these are not political issues. These are biblical issues that have political applications. Like there are no political issues. There are only biblical issues that have political applications. So abortion is not a political issue. It's, it's a biblical issue. For I knew you in your mother's womb and set you apart to be a prophet to the nations. John the Baptist leapt in Elizabeth's stomach whenever Jesus walked into the room. What is that? Life happens at conception. This is not a political issue. It is a biblical issue. Transgenderism, homosexuality, Jesus himself teaches. Not some obscure verse in Leviticus. He teaches us. He says that marriage between one man and one woman. He affirms biological sex and marriage, one man, one woman, do not set apart what God has put together. Jesus teaches these things. These are not political issues. Do not buy into the hashtags. Do not buy into the rhetoric. Do not buy into the lies of culture that seek to silence you. No, stand up, speak out for what you believe is right and true. There are no political issues. It's, a, it's an attack and an attempt of the enemy to be able to make you cower and to be fearful and to live out of the fear of man rather than living in the fear of God. Culture will change, but scripture will never change. Doesn't matter if people believe it's right or wrong. Scripture itself will never change. And here's Peter's encouragement to you. Are people gonna make fun of you for this? Yeah. Is this a hard pill to swallow? Yes. Are people gonna oppose you, unfriend you on Facebook? Are people gonna think you're crazy? Yes. And that's okay because you're not living for their approval anyway. Because at the end of the day, you're not gonna stand before other people on judgment day. You're gonna stand before God and give an account for your life. And God ultimately is our judge, and we long to hear the words, well done, good and faithful servant. Here's what he says. But if when you do good and you suffer for it, you endure, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. When you stand up for what is right, God is proud of you. You will never go wrong doing right by God. When you stand up for truth, God is pleased with you. And when you speak the truth, God is, God is close to you. What good is it to suffer when you do evil? It's of no use. But when you suffer for doing good, this is a gracious thing in the sight of God. 